today we're going to have a debate. We all know that in Judaism we have positive commandments. Those are the things that we need to do as a, as, to serve God as a commandment. And then there are the things that we are forbidden from doing. And so those are what we're going to be calling the don'ts. Those are the negative commandments. Um, and the debate here is going to be which is greater. And um, I was talking to a friend before the debate, and it's like, oh my God, what do you mean greater? And I think that one of the things that we're going to also have to sort of figure out here is probably what do we mean by greater? Um, because that's, that's a big question. What, what do you mean what's greater? Do it or don't do it? Um, okay. So um, just want to introduce our debaters. Um, this is the first on my, well, on my immediate right is Rabbi Shace Taub. Rabbi Shace Taub is a um, popular weekly columnist at Ami Magazine. He is the best-selling author of a book called God of Our Understanding, which is a spiritual view toward um, addiction recovery. Um, he is, the New York Times called him a phenomenon, which is really amazing. And he's also the creator of the JLI course called Soul Maps. Rabbi Manis Friedman is also a world-renowned author, lecturer, and philosopher. He's written a number of books. Um, I've, I've read a couple of them, and they're amazing. Um, Rabbi Friedman is the co-founder of the Beis Chana Institute of Jewish Studies in Minnesota. And um, he has also served, this is really amazing, as a simultaneous translator for the live televised talks of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Okay, so we're going to start. Um, we're going to give each of, of our rabbis here an opportunity for opening remarks. You're going to each have seven minutes for your, for your opening remarks. And I think one of the reasons they put me here is because I'm going to actually hold you to your seven minutes. Um, so you have an opportunity. We'll start with, um, I think we're starting with Rabbi Friedman. Um, you have seven minutes to give an opening statement about positive commandments. And you can start now. When I first heard about this idea, to have a debate on the subject. I don't understand. What's the debate? Of course the do is more important than the don'ts. And then I was told I have seven minutes. I don't need seven minutes. <laughs> what you do is obviously more important than what you don't do. In fact, in fact, halachically, there is a principle that says that the positive commandment overrules the negative commandment. So, for example, we have a conflicting uh, statement, statements about Shabbos. On Shabbos, you're not allowed to shed blood. You're not allowed to draw blood. But if a child is born and the eighth day is Shabbos, you do a circumcision. So the question is, how are you allowed? And the answer is, because a positive commandment overrules the negative commandment. So on Shabbos, you're not allowed to draw blood, but the mitzvah of circumcision is a positive commandment to be circumcised, and the positive overrules the negative. In fact, in Tanya, the Rebbe makes a very interesting observation. It would seem at first glance that negative commandments are more important or more significant because they are harder to fix. If you want to do tshuva, to do tshuva for a sin that you committed is hard. Certain sins, harder, certain sins, less. But the Rebbe points out that that does not indicate the importance or the power of the negative commandment. In fact, it shows the importance of the positive commandment. Because for the positive commandment, you almost can't do tshuva. You fail to do the mitzvah, it's gone. Regret doesn't change that. You can regret what you were not supposed to do. But to say, I regret not being good, <laughs> well, that, 
He didn't do it. So it's much harder to make up for that. There's a gap. I'll tell you a quick story. My, my father was imprisoned by the communists in uh, Czechoslovakia for smuggling Jews out of communist countries. And while he was in prison, he, he vowed that if he got out, which was not, not, not guaranteed, if he got out, he would say a certain amount of Tehillim every day. And he did all his life. One day, it was a winter day, there was a fire at the yeshiva building. My father was in charge of the building. And he woke up very early, rushed out there to see what's going on, had to deal with the police, it was arson, there was a fire department, the insurance. By the time he got home, it was late. He quickly davened and went to sleep. He didn't say the Tehillim that day for the first time in many years. Anyway, he had written to the Rebbe about buying a house in Crown Heights. That night, he got an answer from the Rebbe with a blessing to buy the house. And at the bottom of the page, the Rebbe wrote, Tehillim, question mark. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it seems that the Tehillim that he hadn't said that day left a blank space someplace in heaven where it was supposed to be, and the Rebbe felt it. Where is your Tehillim? So it is rather obvious that the positive mitzvah, which is motivated by love, motivated by kindness, is much more significant than the don'ts, the things you're not supposed to do because they're not so good and they're not holy and they're not what God wants. And I will be amazed to hear what Rabbi Taub has to say. <laughs> How can you argue with this? I rest my case. Okay. <laughs> Rabbi Tal, before you start, um, I want to just, I want to just reset my clock. So that was that was under five minutes, actually. Just for what it's just, if people are trying to have a sense of time. Are, are there are there rollover minutes like with cell phone play? Well, we'll see at the end. Okay. No, no, you don't get the rollover minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a family plan. Okay, so now we're going to give Rabbi Taub seven, up to seven minutes to make his case for the don'ts. Oh, thanks, awesome. Now you guys can see your time too. It's up, it's up there. You. Thank you. you. <clears throat> All right. I'll do this so I don't have to lean forward. Okay, perfect. First of all, I agree with everything that Rabbi Friedman just said. I usually agree with everything Rabbi Friedman says. What kind of debate is this? <laughs> no, no, however. No. And that's no, contradic no contradiction to the fact that I intend to explain that the negative prohibitions are greater than the positive commandments. I'm not going to disprove anything there, Abby Friedman said. It's all true. But I'd like to bring out another angle. What is a mitzvah? What's a mitzvah altogether? A mitzvah is a connection. It comes from the word tzavsa which means a bond. And every mitzvah that we do, whether positive or negative, is another bond with the commander of the commandment, with God. And each mitzvah is another type of bond. What's the difference between the type of bond that's forged through the performance of a positive commandment and the type of bond that is forged through the adherence to a prohibition and negative mitzvah. We have to understand that there are levels. There are levels of mitzvahs. When Moses first meets God at the burning bush, and he asks, who are you? And God tells Moses, 
Look, my essential name you can't know, but I'll tell you how to mention me. I'll tell you how to refer to me. And he says the words, Ze shmi la'olam v'zichri doir doir. This is my name forever and my way of being mentioned for all generations. And the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, explains in Toyra Oir, which is a collection of his discourses on the Parsha, that Shmi, which means my name, Shin is 300, Mem is 40, Yud is 10, so that's 350. Plus Yud and He. Yud is 10, He is 5, that's 15. It's 365. Do I have an accountant here? Room full of Jews, I gotta have one accountant. Okay? You're close enough. Just, so just remember that number, 365. Zichri, that's Zion is 7, Chof is 20, Resh is 200, Yud is 10, so I've got how many there? 237. Plus Vav and He, Vav is 6, He is 5, that's 11, 237 plus 11 is 248. 237 plus 11. 237 plus 11 is 248. What does the Alter Rebbe say? If you imagine the four letter name of God vertically as a map of reality, so to speak. You have Yud and He and Vav and He. You have the higher two letters are Yud and He. The lower two letters are Vav and He. Shmi plus Yud He is 365. Zichri plus Vav and He is 248. What does it show you? That the 365 is up here, the 248 is down there. What is 365 and 248? 365 prohibitions, 248 positive commandments. The negatives are higher than the positives. Okay, so I just told you a lot of gematria and numbers, okay, but how do you explain this? Let's, let's bring this down to earth. Every mitzvah is a connection, but there are different levels of connection. Some Energy, godly energy, lends itself to our being able to harness it, to channel it. And it expresses itself in a mitzvah that you can do. That you can pick up in your hand, you can pick up the lulav and the esrug. And you can hold them in your hands. And when you do that, you're actually channeling this godly energy. You know why you can pick it up in your hands and channel that godly energy? Because relatively speaking, it's from a lower level. Which is why, precisely why, you can handle it. Handle it literally, like you can pick it up in your hands and manipulate it. You can hold on to it. Also, you can handle it. You can deal with it. You can manage it. There are lights, there are energies from God that are so lofty that we can't handle them. There are no objects within which they can become manifest. There are no deeds that we can express with our physical bodies. They're so lofty that the only way we relate to them is through the not doing. So God gives us 248 connections that we can handle and 365 connections that we can't handle. You have one minute. Thank you. And in his kindness, even that light that's so lofty that we can't handle it, he gives us a way of connecting to it through the not doing. Another way to look at this is 248 and 365. You might hear the number 248 in shul, in synagogue, when they say the Mishaberach prayer for healing the sick, and they mention the 248 limbs. There are 248 body parts. A body part is sort of binary. It either it's functioning or it's not. So you're either doing the thing or you're not doing it. It comes with the positives. You can do them or not do them, but if you're not doing them, you have no connection to them. 365 are the days of the solar year. You are not doing the prohibitions all the time, which this shows us the loftier connection, Five something seconds. that we can be connected to at all times without limitation. The negatives have no limit. Okay, thank you. Okay. So now we're going to have a question to the do side. 
Um, Rabbi Friedman, I'm going to give you five minutes to answer this question. In your opening remarks, you gave an example of a positive, of a positive commandment pushing off um, a negative commandment, such as the, the bris that you talked about. So how do you explain, then, the principle of mitzvah haba ba'avera, that a mitzvah that entails the commission of a sin invalidates the mitzvah? For example, for example, if you steal a lulav and an esrog, can you fulfill the mitzvah with it? And the answer is no. So your question is, if a positive mitzvah outweighs a negative mitzvah, why shouldn't I be able to fulfill a mitzvah even though I'm violating a negative, right? Yes. Well, the only time that that's true is if the mitzvah and the sin don't come simultaneously. So you steal the esrog, then you do the mitzvah. They're not simultaneous. <laughs> or you steal the sukkah. Then you sit in it and fulfill a mitzvah. See, there, the positive does not negate or, or cancel the negative because they're not in conflict. They're two separate activities. So you can actually do both. Which means you can do the mitzvah without stealing it. So why should it cancel? Uh -huh. But when they're in conflict and it's got to be one or the other, then the positive mitzvah outweighs the negative mitzvah. But where you can do both, then do both. And if you choose to do the mitzvah dafka through the sin, that's not acceptable because it's not necessary. Could you just say a little bit more about the, the if you stole a lulav? See, I, I, I switched it to the sukkah. Okay, could you say a little more about that? Yeah, it's a little harder to steal a sukkah. <laughs> hey, too lazy to sin? <laughs> <laughs> The problem with stealing a lulav and esrog is that when you pick it up, you fulfill the mitzvah. Because okay. that's it. That mitzvah is to pick it up. So as you're stealing it, you're fulfilling the mitzvah. Okay. But the sukkah is really, you steal the sukkah, you're not fulfilling anything. You put it up and then you sit in it, then you're fulfilling the mitzvah. So they really come in separate uh, activities, separate times, and so on. So Com I still insist that the positive mitzvah is more important, and the fact that you can't do a positive mitzvah through a sin is only because the sin was not necessary. If you're going to do a mitzvah, do it kosher. <laughs> Why does it have to come through a sin? Complete? Okay. All right, so now we're going to give Rabbi Taub um, a question. Can I ask oh, a follow up to your question? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm making up that rule. Oh, this, can. Okay. This, this, it's not a new question, it's a follow up to the question. So you, uh, you asked the question about a, a mitzvah that entails the commission of a sin. Rabbi Taub, we're, we're going to do this in two minutes, though, okay? It, yeah, okay, okay. fine. No, my, my question takes 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, how come we don't. Sound the shofar or shake the lulavan uh, esrog if the holidays fall on Shabbos. The answer is going to take more than a minute. Sorry. Two two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Two minutes. Now you're getting your roll over time. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> the rabbis decreed that when Rosh Hashanah comes out on Shabbos, we should not blow the shofar. Why? Because some people don't know how to blow the shofar, and they will take the shofar to their teacher's house to ask for instruction. And they will carry the shofar on Shabbos when you're not allowed to carry. So, to prevent that from possibly happening, we don't blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah when it's on Shabbos. And the question is, if the positive mitzvah is so much more important than the negative, why don't we blow the chauffeur? And if somebody violates the negative, you know, if... That's precisely my question. Yep. Thank you. 
<laughs> now, the only answer that exists is in Hasidus. Hasidus says that on Shabbos, you don't need to blow shofar because what the shofar accomplishes is accomplished by the Shabbos itself. Therefore, there is no obligation really to blow the shofar, so that if you did blow the shofar, it is very likely to end up causing somebody to sin because the holiness of it is lacking. So it's not that the negative commandment is more important, not violating Shabbos is more important than blowing the shofar, but because on Shabbos, blowing the shofar is not really a necessary mitzvah at all because Shabbos does it for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rabbi Tab, we're going to go to your question now, okay? Um, so this is to the negative side. Five minutes to answer. If someone is beginning to keep mitzvahs, would you encourage them to begin with the positive commandments or the negative commandments? Okay, I, I see why this is sort of a gotcha question. <laughs> because... I have gone up to strangers on street corners hundreds, maybe thousands of times and asked them to do a mitzvah like putting on tefillin. And I don't think I've ever asked a stranger to stop sinning. <laughs> so, yeah, very, very good question. Great question. I give up. No. <laughs> You're not allowed to give up. <laughs> King David writes in the Psalms, Sur mero vasei toiv, turn away from evil and do good. So there is such a concept as beginning with making sure you're refraining from evil and, and then fo focusing on being proactive. There is such a concept. Nevertheless, you, you ask a good question. If I'm going to go to a stranger and I'm going to start to get them involved in mitzvahs, how am I going to open? And, and it's true. I, I, absolutely. And there's a reason for this. There's a concept of mitzvah gereres mitzvah. That one mitzvah brings another mitzvah. And that's talking about positive mitzvahs. It's talking about building momentum. And there's no question that when you talk about the impression that it makes on a person, not doing doesn't make an impression on a person. They don't even feel that they're not doing. They're not even necessarily cognizant of it. So when they do something and they sort of change up their routine, it makes a big impression on the person. But that's precisely the point. The reason that we approach people with positive mitzvahs at first is because it makes an impression. Subjectively, it's more powerful. But objectively, objectively, what I said in my opening remarks still stands, that there's a deeper connection to God, meaning a loftier energy that is entailed in the adherence to the prohibitions. And in fact, I'll, I'll even add, you know, it talks about in, in, in Pirkei Oves that the first 10 generations were sinners between Adam and, and Noah. And then between Noah and Abraham, again, there were sinners, another 10 generations. And then Abraham came and he took all of their reward. What does it mean Abraham took all their reward? It means that even they, they, they did good, but they couldn't have a relationship with, they couldn't hold on to their own good. Why? Because they were sinners. So objectively speaking, somebody who's still doing things that he's not supposed to be doing, even though we would definitely encourage him to start doing good because it's a, it's a good way of jump-starting the person, getting them on a roll, on a, on a positive trend, that's subjective. The objective reality is that because of the relationship with the negativity, he can't really even own the positive things that he's doing, like those first 20 generations who their reward for the mitzvahs they were doing was just sort of, let's say, sitting on the table for Abraham to come along and pick up. So in, in one sentence to answer your question, yes, we will always approach people to begin with something positive because it, it, it makes an impression and it gets the ball rolling, but that does not imply any in any way uh, that the objective value of the positive mitzvah is superior. Okay, thank you. You have one minute and ten second rollover. Just FYI. <clears throat> okay, Rabbi Friedman, I'm a little bit nervous to ask you this question now because, um, and I'm like rethinking it because there's an assumption in the first part 
And um, so let's get that part out of the way. Um, I'm going to say rather than I'm assuming, I'm going to say I'm wondering whether you agree with what was just said that positive mitzvahs do have a greater impact on a person. So we'll just sort of start with that because I, it was originally phrased, I'm assuming that you agree with that, but now I'm wondering if you agree with that. Um, okay. So if, if so, or if not, or let's just talk about why does or doesn't putting tefillin on someone make them more of a mensch in their dealings with other people? You know, how does that mitzvah affect the person? So does that happen? Or conversely, why doesn't being involved in social, social, justice, social justice, for instance, cause a person to want to put on tefillin? And um, how is it that doing positive commandments that are between man and man doesn't lead to positive commandments between man and God and vice versa? Or does it? What? <laughs> now, I know you know what I just said. I know you know. <laughs> yeah. Your time starts now. I think it proves the point. When you do something positive for someone in a relationship, it brings you closer, which means, like Rabbi Taub said, it means it, you'll do another mitzvah. It'll bring another mitzvah. Why then do we see that people separate the mitzvahs between man and God from the mitzvahs between man and man? Some people are really good in their treatment of their fellow human beings, but they don't really keep the mitzvahs. And then there are those who keep all the mitzvahs, but they're lousy when it comes to human relationships. So there are mitzvahs between man and God, there are mitzvahs between man and man. Like the first five of the Ten Commandments are between man and God, and the second five are between man and man. The reason that they don't cross over is because they're lacking the personal touch. If you really do a mitzvah, like putting on tefillin or going to the mikvah or whatever it is, because you know that this is what God wants, then obviously you're going to be honest in business because that's also what God wants. The problem is that we sometimes are sensitive to the other when it's social because I know that you are going to get upset if I lie to you. I know you're going to get upset if I damage your car or if I steal something from you. And I don't have the heart to hurt you like that. But when it comes to not putting on tefillin, I don't think I'm hurting anybody. So there's something impersonal about what they call the ritual mitzvahs, and impersonal doesn't move me. But then there are other people who are the exact opposite. If it's ritual, then it's holy, it's religious, it's important, it's mystical, but you're going to get upset? Well, who cares about you? You'll get over it. Get, get a new car. <laughs> so it depends on where your sensitivity lies. The, the best proper attitude is God is as sensitive as your neighbor. If you violate his will, if you don't do what he wants, it's just as painful, if not more painful, than when you do something your neighbor doesn't want or your husband or wife doesn't want. May I ask Rabbi Taub a question? Sure, you have two minutes and he has, he's two minutes and 17 seconds to answer. So technical. Technically. <laughs> how, do you, how do you argue that in a marriage, for example, not doing is more important than doing? Like, it's more important that I not forget your birthday than to buy you flowers? How is that possible? My turn to answer? Sure. Okay. Okay. Let, let, I'm going to give you two minutes. For hmm? I'm going to give you You're going to give me two full minutes. minutes. Okay, fine. All right. How about... Ten. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we have to keep moving. Imagine a guy comes home 
three hours late for dinner without calling, without texting, nothing. Nothing. Just strolls through the door three hours late for dinner. But he has a dozen roses for his wife. <laughs> and you're all going to say, well, he bought those roses when he realized how late he was. And I'm going to tell you that's not what I, I mean, that's not what he did. <laughs> he bought the roses at lunchtime. He saw some guy selling them on the street corner, and he, he actually got the pink roses, because that's his wife's favorite color roses. He bought the pink roses, and he had them on his desk all afternoon. He was looking forward to bringing them home to her. And, uh, but then something happened at 5 o'clock. He got a cold. He was, he, was, he was, somebody needed his attention, whatever it was, and he forgot. And an hour went by, and two hours went by, three hours went by, and he was doing other stuff. And uh, a few hours after he was supposed to leave, he grabbed the roses and he went home. When he walks through the door, why doesn't the wife feel loved? Is it that she's just being difficult? She doesn't feel loved because, you know, Rabbi Friedman was talking about when you do a mitzvah, making it about the sensitivity to the other. Well, here's the deal. Maybe you're bringing home roses because you like bringing roses. Maybe you just like being romantic. Maybe that's your thing. You're enjoying it. In fact, it seems to be that that's what that husband's doing. Clearly, he's not doing it for his wife. It's not about her because if it were about her, if he were sensitive to her, he would have thought about her during the three hours when he was not even calling or even texting to let her know he's going to be late for dinner. So where do we see the real sensitivity to the other? Not just in the love, because you can do and do and do, and just because it's an expression of what you like. When do you see real deferment and reverence and respect for the other is when you're sensitive to what would hurt them. My time's up. Your time's up. Would you like to respond for a minute, Rabbi Friedman? Um, I'm impressed. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think you could do it. <laughs> okay. Rabbi Taub. Ready? Okay. Five minutes. You explained earlier how the negative commandments bring a lofty energy into the world, okay? And you distinguish between this effect on the world and the, the effect on the person who does the mitzvah. So what effect, so to speak, on God, what's, what's the, what about the effect on God, which I, Rabbi Friedman talked about a little bit, but what about the effect on God? Are you saying that we don't do this, um, that what we don't do for God is as great as what we do for God? Greater, yeah, greater. Okay, do you want to say a little bit about that, or yeah. you don't? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. So, but I wouldn't, I would just change the wording of the question. You're, you're, you asked, would you say what we don't do for God is as great as what we do for God? Yeah. And, and I would just change it slightly. It's not about what you do for God and what you don't do for God. It's what we do for him, and what we don't do because of him. Mm -hmm. and, and Rabbi Friedman asked me you know, about, about a marriage. Think about it like this. Where is the greater connection? What we do for our spouse or what we don't do because of them? A person can be loving and giving and generous and magnanimous and have no limits, no boundaries. It's like the boy asked the girl, do you love me? She said, I love everybody, right. including you. So giving without self-containment, without boundaries, is not intimate. In fact, and the question was the effect on God, giving can be, albeit in a, in a subtle way, giving, loving, doing, can be a tad selfish. Because when I'm doing for you, it's about me. I'm doing it. And I get noticed for it. I get validation for it. Here, I did something sweet. I did something kind. Ta-da! You know, what do the judges say? 
it can almost be a tinge of a performance. But when I'm not doing, when I'm containing myself, then it's truly humble. First of all, I'm, I'm placing limits upon myself. I'm not expressing myself. I'm, to the, to the contrary, I'm giving you room. I'm making space. I make myself smaller so you have greater space to express yourself. Second of all, there's no aspect of, of validation seeking. Hey, did you see what I did? You can only do that with a positive mitzvah. Did you notice what I did? But think about the things that you're sensitive to not do. You don't get credit for that. Like if you go up to somebody and say, by the way, there was something really inappropriate that I was going to say to you. <laughs> but listen, I have too much respect. I, I held myself in. I didn't do it. Kind, kind of defeats the point. Then you basically said it, but you hinted it, which makes them even crazier. No, to really hold back and to contain yourself means you don't even get noticed for it, which is really humble. You don't even get noticed. Nobody even knows that you did it. Because you didn't do it. It was something that you didn't do. And no one will even know what you could have done. So, you know, you talk about the connection to God. It's just like in a marriage. That the real commitment, the real devotion, is when we can be humble enough to make space for him, to say to him, I will allow you to inconvenience me. Think about the opposite. I'm not trying to reduce Rabbi Friedman's argument to an absurdity, but I, I will. <laughs> but but I will. I'll just take your argument and, and bring it to an extreme. I'll bring it to an extreme. If positive is truly more important than negative, that means I can do whatever I want. I can. I have no limits. Whatever I like, I can do it. If I want to do it, I indulge, even if you don't like it, even if you told me you don't like it, even if you find it disrespectful, as long as I'm mindful to do the things that you like. That sounds intimate. How about this? Why don't we start with contain yourself? Don't do the things that hurt me. And then in that environment of safe boundaries where I know that you won't violate me, you won't do what I don't want you to do, you won't go where I don't want you to go, in that environment of safety, then yeah, I feel open and vulnerable enough to accept the things that you do for me. Thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, by the way, let me add one more thing. Rabbi Friedman mentioned the two tablets between man and man, between man and God. I wanted to remember to mention this. If you want to talk about another aspect of the two tablets, I mentioned before there's 365 prohibitions, 248 positive commandments. And I'm just going to stop you for one yeah. second, okay? Let me just stop you for one second, okay? And what I'm going to say is I'm going to now give you each three minutes to sum up, okay? I'm going to give you each like three minutes to... We're out of questions. I'm, I'll give you each three minutes. So, so what you're going to say now, I think you can say in your, sum, in your, in your summation, Okay, and you can start now. You, Rabbi Tal, can start now. So there are 613 mitzvahs, 365 prohibitions, 248 positive commandments. We know that in Torah everything is exact, nothing is random. So the fact that there is a quantitative superiority, an abundance of negative mitzvahs, prohibitions, 365 as it compared to 248, that also implies a qualitative superiority. And then when you look at the Ten Commandments, I was about to mention the Ten Commandments, how many of the ten start with lo, thou shalt not? You go count it. Seven out of ten. So the bulk of our relationship is about what we don't do. And, it, and it's precisely for the reason that I was mentioning before. You know, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. See, I, I'm, I'm watching the clock there. Yeah. I, I, one time, I was at a, a shul. I won't say where it was, but it was somewhere in the world. And <laughs> it wasn't in the space station. I don't want to say where it was. But 
I was about to go up and give the, the sermon after uh, the Torah reading, and the whole place emptied out. There was no one there. And I said to the rabbi, what's going on? And he said, it's the Kiddush Club. And I said, Kiddush Club? I said, I thought Kiddush Club was like a club. It was like a few guys, if you don't know what it is, a few guys after the Torah reading, they go to the broom closet and they make Kiddush on, on vodka. And, you know, they're being rebellious. Instead, of the, instead and it's, of the sermon. Yeah, instead of the sermon, right. And then, right. So it's, the, it's like the adult version of uh, smoking in the boys' room. Okay. <laughs> so, at any rate, the whole, I said, the whole shul is empty. He says, I couldn't fight it anymore. We just, it's official. The whole thing, Kiddush Club, the whole, the whole shul goes out. They invited you for this? They invited me to come speak in such a setting. Yes, that's why I'm not that saying, crazy. right. Yes, that's why I'm not saying where it was. So they come back in and I said, you know, I've been to a lot of shuls all over the world and I've seen a kiddish club. I've seen many times a kiddish club. But you know what? I've never seen a Havdalah club. Never saw it. And then I told them a story. There was an early Chabad rabbi. He was a rabbi in Bensonhurst back in the 1930s. And he was dealing with these immigrants, you know, American immigrants who were, you know, the first generation in America. And they were really, assimilation was a real issue. And he said something, he, he, he reflected on them. He said, you know, it's interesting. American Jews all know how to make Kiddush, but they don't know, they don't know how to make Havdalah. And he meant it on two levels. I see my time's up right now. I'll take 15 more seconds, if that's okay. okay. He meant it on two levels. One is literally, Friday night, you make Kiddush, but by Saturday night, you know, everybody's been out doing whatever they've been doing, and Havdalah just kind of falls through the cracks. So they, they don't know how to make Havdalah. But he meant it on a deeper level as well. Kiddush is from the word Kadosh, holy. Pronouncing something holy. This is good. We can use this. We can incorporate this. Havdalah means separation. It means a boundary. They know how to include things. They don't know how to discriminate. They don't know how to say enough is enough. Stop. Up to here, we can't go any further. And I think that's really the essence of the positive and the negative com commandments is it's easy to say, I'll do for you. But it's a much deeper connection to say, I will contain myself. I will hold space for you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Rabbi Friedman, I'm going to also give you four minutes because that's what Rabbi Taub actually had. <laughs> if, if you want it. Well, first of all, I have a little suspicion that Rabbi Taub cheated. <laughs> How so? I can't believe this. We're going to do a drug test after the <laughs> I think he studied Hasidus. Yeah. Because uh, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good argument there. But I want to ask one final question. If the main purpose or the primary purpose is not to sin, why did God create the world in the first place? If he didn't create the world, nobody would sin. <laughs> he created the world because if you don't create the world, then you can't do a mitzvah. So it must be the positive mitzvah that motivated creation, not the avoidance of sin. That's my final argument. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that don't work. Nothing's going to work. <laughs> um, do you want to take one or two questions from the audience before we... I like that look on your face that makes me want to say yeah let's take a question from the audience do you want to take i'm going to take i'm going to take one question and, and think about your question okay like think about the question <laughs> i'm going to take one for the don'ts and one for the do's who has a don't question okay this lady right here well, well, if you what? don't ask a question it's even better <laughs> no 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 <laughs> okay this lady here one for the don'ts so the question, I'll repeat it in the microphone, was I had mentioned that not doing is a lot humbler than doing because you get noticed for doing. And the question was, well, you could also anonymously do a positive commandment. You could, you know, like we know how to sin without getting caught. This is doing a mitzvah without getting caught. <laughs> right? 
You could do the mitzvah, nobody would know. Except Hashem, that's right. But here, here's, here's the thing. Let's talk about it like this. It's true. I'll, I'll concede to that. And all I'll say is the tendency to be self-conscious, self-aware in a positive commandment, something you do, is a greater tendency than in the self-containment of adhering to a prohibition, where actually there's no tendency to be uh, self-seeking there. It's all about deferring and making space for the other. But, but, but what I will say is this, that how do I know that I really care about what you want? Only when it comes in conflict with what I want. So the fact that I do what you want me to do, it could be that I like doing it. Or maybe I don't like doing it, but I like doing. I like being active. Everyone likes to be productive. But to not do something, that's really hard. That takes maturity. Sitting still, don't just do something. Sit there. That takes real maturity. And, and so too in a relationship, the, the real mature bond is when I can do that when I can contain myself. Okay, thank you. We're going to take a quick vote, just by a show of hands. Um, <clears throat> don'ts. <laughs> really? There's my husband raising his hand on the don'ts. What? Like, what? You need to raise your hand again. Do's. I think the don'ts one from the do's and the don'ts. The, the, the don'ts one. Wait, I have one more. Both. Yeah, the audience one. That's right. Okay, so everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our debate. Oh, oh what? So, closing? You want to close? Oh, I'm sorry, I would have voted after your closing. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you didn't. You didn't. Go ahead, please, please, please close, please. Okay, go, 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 go. You go, you go, please. I want to, I want to, where did he go? <laughs> he left? He decided it was both and he left. Oh. <laughs> Drop the mic, walk off stage. Okay, here, here's really the, uh, the, the ultimate conclusion. Doing what God wants, even if it's not what you prefer, is, is amazing and fantastic. Not doing what God wants, even though you do want to do it, is amazing. But ultimately, they become equal. It's the same thing. Because if it's about you, then whether you want something or don't want something makes no difference. It's you. So it's not like, I'm in the positive mode or I'm in the negative mode. That's describing me. Once I really get into you, then it makes no difference, as the man said. It makes no difference whether I'm doing for you or sacrificing for you. It's the same thing because it's you. So we have this halachic thing where you don't blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah because you might, ca when it's Shabbos, because you might carry. But interestingly, in the base Hamigdash, they did blow shofar on Shabbos. So the Rebbe explains it like this. When you blow shofar, you're telling God that you are submitting your will and your opinion and your needs to his. You're surrendering by blowing shofar. You're saying, you are my king, I'm coronating you, you're the boss, not me. On Shabbos, when you don't blow the shofar, it's not what you're not doing, it is what you are doing. What you're saying is, you don't need me to coronate you by telling you that I'm not important, because I'm not important. It's like, don't be humble, you're not that important. So if you feel like you need to humble yourself, not exactly humble. 
On Shabbos, we have a greater degree of humility, and that's expressed by not having to say anything. I don't have to tell God that he's God. And I don't have to tell God that I am ins insignificant, because I'm not even significant enough to say that. So there is something positive going on when I don't blow the shofar. Because I'm really saying, God is king. What's the question? Like, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. What, did I just say something amazing? <laughs> it just is, right? So then the question is, why do they blow the shofar in the Beis Hamikdash when it comes out on Shabbos? So there are three levels. One level is where I have to surrender to you. The other is, I don't have to surrender to you. It's all about you. So I don't have to. The third level is, it doesn't matter whether I do or don't. Whatever you prefer is fine with me. So if you want me to blow the chauffeur, I'll blow the chauffeur, not because I have to humble myself, but because you said so. And if you tell me not to, then I won't. And the amazing example is, a king, when he goes into his private chamber, in Jewish law, the Jewish king, King David, what did he do with his crown when he took it off? He was not allowed to put it on the head of one of his servants. He had to put it on a shelf. The reason is, if you put the crown on some servant, he starts to get ideas. Hey, like maybe I'm something after all, you know? You put it on a shelf, the shelf gets no ideas. <laughs> In the temple, people were so completely tuned into God, it was like they were a shelf. You want to put the crown on my head? Put it. I'm not going to have any ideas because you're the king, you're the only king, and that's all there is. You don't want to put it on my head? Fine. You put it on my head, that's all so good. So I don't even have to refrain from saying that I'm humble because it's not about me at all. And that's when doing and not doing become exactly the same. So in the end, even not doing is doing. <laughs> because it's saying it's all about you. So humility doesn't mean I'm nothing. Humility means you're everything. Thank you so much. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects, but that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions and so on. If you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at nine o'clock well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at nine o'clock, a more informal chat, which uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out, click on the link and join us. Try it, you'll like it. <laughs>